Hey, welcome back everyone. There are only two more episodes left to go in the bathroom, which means I am almost finished up in here. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna start off with a trim around the windows and the door. About 15 years ago, when the previous owners of the house remodeled this bathroom, they stripped everything in here down to the studs. And they put in fiberglass insulation and that really scary wiring that I had to remove. And they put up the drywall and they also removed the one large window that was in the bathroom and they replaced it out for these two. Now, um, the one thing that I wish that would have saved from that renovation was the trim. It would have been really nice to put it back in here. That way this bathroom would have matched the rest of the house a whole lot better, but the trim's gone for good. And what are you going to do, right? So, I uh, brought up a piece of trim from downstairs just to show you the width of the trim that used to be in this room. And if I hold it up to the window, now imagine it going all the way around. It just uh, doesn't look right, does it? Be too, this is just too wide of a trim for a window this size. So when I was putting on the tile, I decided that uh, a three inch wide trim around the window would look a whole lot better than one that was five inches. So let's go over to the table saw and rip down some boards for the trim. Earlier in the week, I picked up two clear yellow pine 1x12 boards from the hardware store. To get the most efficient use out of each one, I cut one 3 inch strip out of each board, followed by two 5 and a quarter inch strips for the closet door frame, and with the remaining amount, two 2 inch strips for the window sills and skirting boards. Then I sand off all the kerf marks left behind from the saw blade with my random orbital sander using 220 grit sandpaper. When I trim out a window, I always start with the window sill first. So I'm just taking a measurement off of some window trim in one of the bedrooms and it looks like the window sill extends past the edge of the trim by about an inch. This is a picture of my bathroom window and over here and here is where the tile butts up to the edge of the trim. So I know the distance between these two points is 21 and a half inches. So when the window sill goes in, it has to extend out past the trim one inch on either side. So I just have to add two inches onto this number and that would be 23 and one half inches. So now I know how long to cut the piece of wood for the window sill. Well, that fits pretty good. So I want to notch out here and over here. So I'm going to put a line right at the edge of that drywall. Doesn't have to be perfect. One on either side. And I need to know the depth that it needs to be recessed in. So it looks like three quarters of an inch on that side and the same over there. I replaced the regular saw blade with a stacked dado blade. And instead of using my tape measure to find the height of the blade, I use this piece of three quarter inch stock. And when the top of the teeth go right to the edge of the board, I know I found three quarters of an inch. The dado blade is made up of five different blades to make up a cutting width of five eighths of an inch. This type of blade is a real time saver when you want to remove a lot of material at once. After I complete cutting one side of the sill, I do the same thing on the other side. Let's go see how well it fits. That fits pretty good. It's nice and tight against the window. There's a little gap here and there, but that's okay because it's going to be covered up with trim anyway. So uh, let's measure for the trim that goes right here. This window has these little ribs that go all the way around it that measure one eighth of an inch. So there's two of them showing down here and that's what I want to keep for the reveal all the way around the window. So I just have to measure from here all the way up to the second rib on the top. And that will give me the height of the piece of trim I need on both sides. I ripped down a piece of scrap wood to three quarters of an inch. Then I cut the three pieces of the frame to size, followed by a quick sanding. In an ideal window trim installation, this piece of wood would be nailed into the studs in the wall, but there aren't any. It's just drywall because this window is mounted improperly. It's just too far into the house. So if you look outside, you can see the window ends here when it really should end all the way out there. Now that's two problems. So there's nothing to nail to in the house. And the other problem is um, 
any water that would land on the windowsill or melted snow just rolls off and goes inside my wall. So in the springtime, what I can do to fix that is wrap aluminum all the way around the, the window on the outside, and that'll make it watertight. But on the inside, uh, the only way to attach this piece of trim and the other two around it is to attach them to themselves and onto the windowsill. I'm marking the location of the trim with my knife because if I used a pencil, the pencil line would be too wide. I wouldn't be able to erase it with sandpaper once this is all assembled. I pre-drill all the pieces of trim with a countersink drill bit. Then I put the frame together with two inch wood screws. Okay, this is looking pretty good. Looks like we have equal reveal all the way around between the window and the inside trim. So let's go measure for the outside trim. I'm gonna keep the same quarter inch reveal for the outside trim as I did for the window. So the outside trim is gonna end one quarter inch before this edge. So if I take my tape measure and place it here, and when I get to the top, all I have to do is add a quarter inch on from the bottom of this trim for the height of the side pieces. I'm just attaching the side pieces on with my pin nailer and if you don't know what a pin nailer is, it is exactly as it sounds. It is a nail gun that shoots out nails that are the size of pins. And if you compare these nails to regular nails, these don't hold hardly anything. They're just there to tack something up temporarily. And the reason I'm using them here is because I don't have an extra set of hands to hold these rails on while I'm taking my measurement across the top, which is 21 and a half inches. I want to attach all the pieces of the outside trim together with more than just nails. So uh, I'm just thinking pocket hole screws. And to do that, I was gonna use this, my Craig jig. So uh, the pocket holes are gonna go in these two pieces. So let's get these out of here. You can see the pin nails, they don't hold very much, which is nice. You can see one of those nails right there. They're so thin, they snap off really easily. Just like that. I'm gonna put two pocket holes in the end of each board. So if I line my board up between these two holes, I can clamp the board down in the back and then drill up my two pocket holes with a specialized Craig drill bit. And that is what the pocket hole looks like. Now to assemble the frame, I'm just putting a little bit of glue on the end of my board. Smooth it out there. Then I put both boards together, making sure this edge is flush and I clamp down with my special clamp made by uh, the same company as the Craig jig. And I put a couple of screws in there and it draws everything nice and tight. And it makes for a nice strong joint. Let's go see what this side looks like. Yeah, see how nice and tight that is? I got a little bit of glue ooze out, but that's not so bad because I'm just gonna go sand over it when I'm done. Same type of clamping as the other side. And the only difference is I got a couple of pieces of wood here acting as shims just to raise everything up because the windowsill is so thick. And if those weren't there, this clamp would not be working right now. So um, on the other side, I used silver screws and these are kind of a coppery bronze color. And the silver ones are inch and a quarter. And if I use those over here, they would have shot right out the bottom. So these one inch screws work best for right here. Now to attach the outer frame to the inner frame with one inch brad nails. That looks pretty good. Well, there's just one more piece of wood that needs to go on here to make this match the other windows in the house. So that is the piece that goes below the windowsill, the skirt board. And on the other windows, it was the same width as from the outside edge here to there. On this one, it is 21 and a half inches.
I've run into a little problem here with my apron board. It is too thick. If I run my thumb across it, it is almost flush with the outside edge of the sill. So the reason this happened is when I was coming up with the depth of my sill, I forgot to take into account the uh, thickness of the tile and the glue behind it. So everything is off. Now to fix that, I could just rebuild the sill, which is something I don't want to do because that was kind of a lot of work. Or I can just cut this down by about half and uh, that would look just as good. So I'm gonna go do the second one instead. I keep the board tight to the saw's fence as I slowly push the board through, keeping my fingers far away from the blade. Then I sand off any saw marks from the back of the board. Now that the board is half as thick, nailing it to the sill will be really difficult. I carefully aim the nail gun as straight as I can so the nails go through the sill without missing the apron. After everything is finished, I give the frame a final sand before I give it a coat of wood stain. Hey, look who's back. Hi, Caesar. I promise I'm done making noise for a while. Okay, I'll see you later. <laughs> so, how many of you caught the mistake I made in the video about eight minutes back? Well, I had just finished explaining with my drawing that I needed to add an inch on either side of the windowsill, which went beyond the edge of the tile. And what happened in the next scene? The windowsill was exactly the same width as it was between the two points where the tile ended. I don't know what happened, but uh, three minutes ahead in the video, poof, just like magic, the windowsill was back to the way it was supposed to be with those little one inch extra pieces on the ends. This is what's been going on. We've had a really bad January so far. Some of the days have been below zero, and with that comes frozen pipes and broken furnaces. Most of my days have been doing nothing but fixing those things. And the other days uh, have been above 20 degrees, which is nice, but that brings a lot of snow. So I've been clearing out driveways and sidewalks with my snowblower, and that took up most of my days from there. I think I might have spent an hour or so a day here some days of the week and my mind just hasn't really been into this house. But the good thing of all of that, if there is anything at all, is I'm wearing a t-shirt. And that's because over the spring of last year, I put 18 inches of blow fill into the attic uh, on top of the six inches that was already there. So there's two feet of insulation up there and that is really keeping the heat up here. Um, if you remember in the video last year when I was working during the winter, I had my heavy card heart jacket on and a sweatshirt beneath that. And that was the only thing I could do to wear to keep myself warm up here. And uh, this is great. I, it's like a normal house now. So uh, while I stain up this windowsill and the other one in the bathroom, let's go back and watch some video from last year of me insulating the attic. In February of last year, when I was taking up the floorboards in the attic, I found these two little guys hibernating in the insulation. I left them alone until the beginning of April when it was really starting to warm up outside and the snow was mostly gone. By the time I came back with my coffee can to carry them out, the one on the left had already crawled away and made it outside through a hole in the soffit. The other bat was still mostly asleep and when I tried putting him in the coffee can, all he wanted to do was hang on to my warm glove. Some people might think, why save the life of a bat? Well, bats eat the one thing I hate the most, mosquitoes. That and those little flies that like to dive bomb into your eye, which is why I put a bat house on the side of my barn. I just live four houses down the street, so we went for a little walk. I never relocated a bat before. I thought I was gonna have to try to stuff him in somehow, but he just crawled in on his own. Hopefully he, or maybe she, stays around for the summer and keeps the mosquito population down in my yard. About a month later, I rented the blow fill insulation machine and purchased 20 bales of fiberglass insulation from the hardware store. The machine is more awkward than heavy and I needed some help from Brett, one of my workers, to help move in all the parts and to run the insulation blower. 100 feet of blower hose comes with this machine and it's stored in a garbage can. After much unraveling and untangling, it was time to drag it up to the attic. There's the end that blows. We did it. Woo! Okay, we're off. The attic is about 30 feet long 
and the staircase is just about in the middle. So I pulled up about 20 feet of hose, so I had enough to cover all the hard to reach places. Meanwhile, downstairs, Brett screws on the hose onto the blower, along with supplying power by plugging in an extension cord. The light comes on and the machine is ready to go. I've rented this machine once before on another attic, but uh, I've never run this end of it. I've uh, let someone else do that. So I had to read the instructions to see what's going on uh, so I can relay those to Brett. And it looks like what we're supposed to do is, these are the bales that go in here, and you're supposed to cut them in half, and then uh, each half goes through this end here. And, um, and then it goes into the hopper, goes to the really nasty hose we just threaded upstairs, and um, and then and away the insulation goes. So let's chop up some of these things. We cut the plastic all the way around the center line of the bales with a utility knife and snapped them in half. Brett was a lot better with this step than I was, though I found punching the bales worked pretty well and it doubled as a good stress reliever too. Cutting these in half only took a few minutes, then I was upstairs and put on my coveralls and face mask. Brett turned on the blower and pushed in the first half bale. There's a built-in knife inside the hopper that cuts the bag and helps release the insulation. After a few shakes, the bag breaks free and he gently pushes the bale down inside the paddles. The paddles are pretty far down inside the machine, but it's probably not a good idea to put your whole arm inside. The insulation begins to flow through the hose, so let's go watch some time-lapse. The great thing about all that new insulation in the attic, it's increased my R value up there 40 more points. Now, that's a big number and it's a really good thing. So if you don't know what the R stands for in R value, it means the resistance to something. So if it's winter time and it's cold outside, it's the resistance to the cold entering the house as well as the heat escaping from it. And in the summertime, it's the other way around. So the larger the R value number, the better. It's like money. And what it does is it saves you money because it saves you money on your heating and cooling costs. Now, uh, I said earlier that there was uh, 18 inches of the pink stuff up there. Well, I was a little bit off, as you could see by the video. It was closer to um, 12 to 14 inches, something like that, which is what gave me that R40. Now, beneath that was the cellulose stuff, and there's six inches of stud or floor joist in there and uh, it's like 3.2 to 3.8 per every two inches. So I'm rounding that average to about a 10. So 10 plus 40 is 50, and um, that's really pretty good. So 
uh, in our area, we live really close to Lake Erie and we get a lot of cold air across it from Canada, which dumps on us along with a lot of snow. Uh, and um, I think, according to the code book, we have an R value of uh, 60 to 65 for our attics. So 50, it really isn't that bad, especially for a rental. So uh, that makes me happy. And I guarantee it'll make the next tenant happy too when they have to pay the, the heating bill and the cooling costs too. Um, well, as you can see, I've been touching this thing the whole time, so it's gotta be dry. Uh, so let's go take this one and the other one over to the bathroom and get it nailed to the wall. First, I apply a bead of silicone caulk around the window to stop any drafts from coming in. Then I run a strip of construction adhesive on the back of the apron board to secure it to the wall because nailing it through the tile would be impossible. I press the frame into the wet caulking and secure it to the wall with two inch finished nails. To cover up the nail holes, I apply a little color match putty with the end of my finger and wipe away the excess. Finally, I mask off the window frame with painter's tape and apply a few coats of amber shellac for a glossy, easy to clean finish. While that's drying over there, I'm gonna get the trim put up around the doorway. Now, it seems like everything I've done to this house so far has not gone as smoothly as I like. So uh, here's the problem over here. Earlier in the video, I said the previous owner stripped the plaster and lath off in here and they replaced it with half inch drywall. Now, the problem with that is this stuff is thinner than what the plaster and lath used to be. So if I hold my framing square up to the edge of the door jam, you can see there's a quarter inch gap back there. Now, uh, before I had put the tile up in here, I was still trying to figure out what to do with the door jam problem. So I thought maybe if I took it off the wall and denailed it and run it through the table saw, that would get me the right thickness to match my wall. But uh, that seemed like a lot of work. So I uh, just for fun put a tile up against the edge and it turned out to be perfectly flush. So that's why the tile went up before the uh, door trim went on. So to solve the rest of the problem, I'm just gonna cut a quarter inch strip of wood with my table saw and nail it to the back of the door trim. I chip a few tiles off the wall, so I have a place to nail my trim board. Then I mark the rows with some painter's tape so I don't forget where to nail. Finally, I nail the trim to the wall with two inch finished nails. On the other side of the doorway, I bring out the wall with quarter inch wood strips. Then I cut the hole out in the middle of the trim board for my light switch with my oscillating saw. After a quick sand, I nail on the other side piece of trim, followed by the lintel. I was thinking that building the door jam for the closet was going to be a really easy job because I'm the one that built the closet. But uh, no, it's not that way at all because I made a mistake. Now, uh, if I put my door jam board up to the top like that, and put a level across it to the one in the other doorway, it is about 3 eighths of an inch too low. So to fix that, I could either raise this up, which is going to end up wrecking my drywall. So that's something I don't want to do. Or I could take this board home and run it through my board planer and get it down to the right thickness. Now that looks so much better. So if these two doorways weren't as close together as they are, say they were four feet apart from each other, I don't think I would have had to change the thickness of that board. But because they are so close and they're actually touching, um, if I hadn't changed the thickness to match uh, the height of this one over here, I think it really would have looked like an obvious mistake. Now the side jam boards get set in place and shims are placed behind them to make sure the boards are perfectly plumb. Once everything looks good, they get nailed into place and the shims get scored and snapped off. The trim boards get ripped down to size in the table saw, followed by a whole lot of sanding. On one of the trim boards, I make a slight back bevel with my hand planer. I do this so when the two corner trim boards come together, they make for a seamless fit. I start with the lintel first to make sure the trim has the same continuous flow from one doorway over to the other. 
Then I nail on the two side pieces along with the inside closet trim with two inch finished nails. All the masking tape is on, so now I'm ready for the stain. The color I'm using is called Red Oak. This is a Minwax product. Uh, I did a few samples on some uh, scraps of this trim before I even uh, put the color onto the, the, uh, the trim around the windows because I was just worried that I would pick the wrong one. But this one seems to match the best. And I think this color has been around for a very long time. Um, my house is, uh, was built around 1864 and it's got the same color in it. And this one is about 101 years old now and same thing there. So it must have been a really popular color. This is uh, oil-based stain and uh, this is exactly what they would have used back 101 years ago when they were finishing the woodwork in this house. And uh, I don't know when water-based stain was made, but it had to have been many years after. So uh, I used to use water-based stain all the time. It was just something that my uh, mom uh, always used. I think it's because it was easy cleanup and uh, you didn't have to use turpentine or whatever to, to rinse the brush out. It was just simple water and uh, let it dry and you're good again for the next time. But, uh, oh, one day I went to the hardware store just to see what the difference was between the water and oil-based and there is a major difference. <laughs> the stuff, the oil-based, it just flows so much better and you can see it, it goes on, it's thinner than paint, but it just flows right onto the wood and, and absorbs really quickly and gives you a nice even tone, which is something hard to do with pine. And uh, once I, once I tried oil-based for the first time, I, I never went back to the water-based. I know it's harder on the environment, but it sure makes my life easy when it comes to woodworking. The only downside is it stinks. <laughs> water-based is really low VOC, but this stuff, it, uh, oh, it smells a little like gasoline mixed with turpentine. And I don't know if you can hear the bathroom fan on right now, but uh, it's sucking some of the bad gases out. But at the same time, the furnace is running and it's blowing them around the house. So uh, before I started with the staining, I took Caesar home because I didn't want him breathing the, uh, these bad gases in. So if you're wondering why I'm wearing glasses while I'm staining, um, probably seems like the most least problematic uh, thing that could happen to my eyes. Um, well, there's two reasons for that. First one is I'm old <laughs> and I need glasses to, to see. These are not only safety glasses, but they're also uh, slightly magnified so I can really get good detail while I'm doing this. I really don't want to mess anything up here. And the other one is uh, about, uh, oh, I don't know, I was in my 20s. And I was working on a house about a block and a half from here. And uh, it was nearing the end of the day. It was summertime. But uh, I was outside putting some shellac on a door because I was uh, remodeling the house with a friend and uh, I seemed to have more information about what was going on than he did. So he kept coming out and asking me questions every few minutes. And I was happy to answer the first two or three, but um, it's starting to get kind of old. <laughs> so uh, by the fourth or fifth question, he came out and uh, I set the can of shellac down on the table next to uh, where I was uh, working on a door. And I set it down kind of hard. Um, so hard that uh, you know how a raindrop, when it falls into a, a puddle, it has a, 
an effect it goes in absorbs and then goes out in the form of ripples so imagine that in reverse inside my can of shellac and uh, so when it goes in reverse the shellac just shoots out like a rocket and my eye happened to be directly in line with that rocket and it just went right in and oh did that burn shellac is a alcohol based product and uh, imagine a shot of alcohol right in your eye it uh, that, that would not feel good at all so um, <laughs> so I uh, I teared up for probably a good 10 minutes. I was thinking I was gonna have to go to the emergency room and have them flush it out somehow. I didn't know how they would do that, being alcohol-based, but uh, I, uh, I naturally did it on my own. And um, I was okay after that. But uh, <laughs> I learned two things that day. One was to wear safety glasses while working on woodwork, doing staining and shellacking. And the other one was to find a little patience <laughs> with the people I work with. That's it for the stain. It uh, turned out really well. It matches the old stuff really nicely. Um, I've got about three, two, three more hours for this to dry. So in the meantime, I've got a little bit more tiling to do over here uh, between the tub and the trim. stain looks to be dry so the next thing to do is to fill in the nail holes with some putty and this is what I'm going to use. It's by the same company as the stain and it is a very close color match. So the big question is, is does this stuff go on before or after the stain? And the answer is it depends on the situation. So if I know I have a good color match it goes on after the stain goes on but if I don't have a good color match and I can't get the right color from the store and I can't blend a few of these together to make the right color, then I put it on before the stain. Now, this stuff does not absorb stain. It's just how it is. But if it's a small enough hole, like a nail hole, then uh, the stain acts more like paint and it goes right over the, uh, the putty and it blends everything all right together. 
Now it's time for some shellac, and I'm cheating here by using the premix stuff. Now uh, this stuff does have a shelf life of about a year, and uh, beyond that, it still uh, goes on fine and it dries fine, but um, it has more of a rubbery finish after that year is up versus um, the fresh stuff, which gives you a nice, hard, durable finish. Um, if you're a diehard woodworker and you want to have fresh on hand all the time, you can do this. You can buy these shellac chips and then um, add some ethanol to it. This is about a quarter pound here, so you'd add about, uh, oh, I think a quart of ethanol to it. And then you mix it up in a can and then it's ready to go, just like this stuff. So this uh, goes on real easy. I like to put nice long strokes on there with my brush. And this is a nice brush too. You want to have the nicest, uh, softest brush whenever you are uh, putting on a finish, whether it be really good paint or uh, shellac or varnish or urethane or whatever. So if you were wondering, because I know you're all dying to know where shellac comes from, uh, <laughs> it comes from a bug called the lac bug, L-A-C. And uh, that comes out of uh, India and Thailand. And it uh, kind of looks like a cockroach, but uh, the female version of it likes to secrete this liquid out of some part of her body, I don't know which, and, uh, <laughs> and makes these little tunnels on uh, the branches of the trees over there. So uh, it acts kind of like a camouflage thing. So she hides out in these tunnels she makes. And that is what shellac is made of. The uh, people of the area, they scrape the uh, tunnels off the, the tree branches and boil them down and put them on a pan. And they, uh, they dry and end up looking like that uh, contents of the bag I just showed you there. I've used shellac for years uh, for a couple of reasons because it looks good. It has that little bit of amber tint to it and that really makes the, uh, the woodwork really stand out. Adds a little bit of something extra to the color that's already there. And uh, the other thing is it dries really quickly because it's an alcohol base. So. I checked to see what was already up here in the existing wood trim and I kind of guessed it was uh, this stuff, shellac, because it had a kind of an amber tint to it. But uh, just to make sure, I took some denatured alcohol on a rag and I applied it to the trim in an inconspicuous place and uh, it came off and then the on the rag was just a little bit uh, amber toned and it um, left kind of a sticky uh, substance on the woodwork. So I know uh, for sure that this, what's up here is shellac. So that's good that I'm making it all match like it used to be. The first coat of shellac is dry and the next thing I do is I take some 400 grit sandpaper with a wooden block on the inside and I just gently go over it, taking off any of the high points left behind from the brush. And this step is really important if you want to have a really good shiny finish at the end of all three coats. So now I'm left with kind of yellowy dust and I use a uh, tack cloth and I just go over it like that. And that picks up all the dust and it's ready for another coat. The second coat is going on nice and smooth because of the sanding I just did. And it's using less shellac than the first time around. So when this dries and I put on the third coat, that's going to go on even smoother than this and look almost like glass. It's the next day, and by the end of the second coat yesterday, uh, it was getting pretty late. So uh, I was able to get the third coat on and the final sand, 
and uh, I think it turned out pretty good. What do you think? Doesn't look too bad for a bunch of bug bark smeared onto some wood. <laughs> well, I'm just about done here with a tile cleanup. And uh, a couple episodes back when I was doing the rest of the tile work on the walls, uh, one of the viewers suggested taking the corners off of my grout float. That way, when the grout gets put on, the corners aren't trying to pull it out at the same time. So I uh, took this to the belt sander and took those corners right off and I tried it on uh, this part over here and it worked great. So thank you for the tip. Now to get the light switch back in, uh, I can't just put it back in the way things are right now because this box is set back too far. So uh, according to the electrical code uh, book, it says that uh, this being wood, uh, the box has to be flush with this outside edge. Now, if this were drywall, um, it could be, I believe, set back as much as a quarter of an inch and still be okay. But it's not, it's wood. So how to solve this problem is with one of these. This is called an extension ring. And uh, this one's a quarter inch thick and they make them at least up to a three quarters of an inch thick, which is gonna work here. And it just goes over the switch like that and inside the hole, and there it goes. This uh, box is now legal. It's right flush to the outside edge of the trim. And it even comes with uh, a couple of screws to uh, put the switch back on. The bathroom door is finally in, and I feel like I'm one step closer to a finished bathroom. So the closet is not gonna get a door, and this is why. I've been in a lot of older homes where the entry door was here and right angle to it was the closet. And somewhere over that house's life, someone has tried to enter the bathroom the same time someone was trying to open the closet door and the closet door got a giant scar across it from the latch of the entry door. I do not want that to happen here because the woodwork is really nice and I wanted to stay that way. So in previous rental bathrooms, I used to put an accordion door up and they look good. They make some nice privacy for the towels and whatnots in the closet, but they don't last long. Tenants like to ruin those things in a year or less. Uh, so I'm gonna try something totally new for this bathroom and I'm gonna put up a bar and hang a cloth shower curtain from it and we'll see how long that lasts. That curtain looks pretty good. Hey, look, there's Caesar. Is that your new dog house? Well, that's it for this video. If you liked it, hit the thumbs up button. If you want to see more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to ring the notification bell so you know when the next video is going to come up. Caesar and I will see you next time. And uh, they replaced that out for these two little guys instead. Now, um, one of the things that I wish Let's start over. I paused too long. All right. So let's go over to the table saw and rip down some more, some boards, some boards for the trim. <laughs> Got to plug it in. Hold on. Pin nails are not very structural compared to a regular nail. Um, oh, that didn't work at all. It is a nail gun that shoots out nails that are the, oops, that are the size of pins. <laughs> Let me shoot myself in the foot. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking pocket hole screws. So to do that, uh, I'm going to drop that on the table. <laughs> oh no, another outtake. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I leave so much blood in all the houses I work in. Oh my goodness. All right. Ah. I'll lick that off. Oh, I'm putting more back on. I'm like a magic marker. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking that building my door jam for the closet was going to be easy. I'm falling off my bucket. Hold on a second. I'm too short. I have to stand in a bucket. Okay. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> Oops. Wood putty by the same brand as the stain, and it is a very similar color. And, uh, I forgot what I was going to say after that. <laughs> All right, the second coat is going on nice and I got dog hair in here. Oh my gosh, where did that come from? And that's what this thing is. So um, they make them, this one's on, this one's on the floor. 
Ha, 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 ha.